Hello, everyone, and welcome to Access Chat. Today, we have Dan Mahoney, who is an active member of our community, our Access Chat community, joining us. And um, Antonio's joining us again. Of course, we have Elaine that always makes sure from my clear text that we are fully accessible since, you know, that's what we're talking about. And Neil decided he would, you know, fly home um, on an airplane during this time. So we don't have Neil joining us this week, but he'll be there on Access Chat on Tuesday. So. Dan, welcome to the program. We're really honored to have you and somebody that is um, that your work is so powerful. So do you mind telling anyone that doesn't know more about who you are and where you're joining us from and where you work and what you're interested in with this topic? Sure. sure. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, my name is uh, Dan O'Mahony or Daniel O'Mahony. My friends call me Dan. Um, I work in Child Vision in Ireland. Child Vision is the National Education Centre for Blind Children. Um, and I live in Dublin, 36, two kids. And what I love to do is I love designing accessible user experiences and accessible interfaces and pretty much everything to do with accessibility. And I think I've been part of the Access Chat community now for a while, on and off for a few years. So, yeah. I'm enjoying the uh, the space, and I love the conversations we have, and hopefully it'll continue on for many years to come. I agree. I, I remember when Antonio and Neil talked to me about doing this. We were we were wondering what, would access chat, you know, find a path for a little while and then fizzle out. But if anything, it's just grown and grown because the reality, user design, UX, accessibility, there's always going to be a need to make sure that everybody can use technology. So if anything, it feels that our conversations are getting richer, especially when people like you join us, Dan, with all the experience that you have. So uh, we, yeah. we've had these conversations before, but we continue to need to have these conversations because technology continues to change so much and it, it's it's fascinating to watch you know everything mm. that's happening with you know the sustainable development goals but also with ai and the iot and the wearables and all of those things that really impact what we are talking about when we're talking about inclusive design so it's it's yeah. exciting so yeah, tell us more about so. your work yeah tell us more about what you're doing okay so um in child vision uh, I work in the reading services department. There's a number of different departments there. Um, as I said, it's a national education center. So we provide a number of different services there. Uh, ophthalmology, we have a lifelong learning program. Uh, there is, there, there, there's the reading services department I mentioned. There, there's a lot of activities that go on. There's primary school, a secondary school, uh, lots of stuff that goes on there. But what I do in particular in the reading services department is we are a national service that provide textbook transcriptions for all the published um, educational books to any student in the visual, any student in the Republic of Ireland with a visual impairment. Um, so that totals, I think it's about 950 at the moment. So that's every school book in, in whatever format they need that makes that's accessible to them. So that could be a text only for, file, which is really just a word file that they can use with a screen reader, be it JAWS, NBDA, um, Zoom, and then also use it with Zoom text. But what we found over the last few years is that a lot of students now are using those text-only files with Braille note takers, um, like Braille Sense, Braille Note. Um, uh, what else we do? We do uh, large print books, so and we uh, aerial aerial font, 24 point size is the minimum. And then we also do what I kind of spent a lot of time doing is I'm the digital media specialist there, so I do uh, the digital books, so Daisy, um, and we're moving into EPUB now as well. Um, what I'm finding with all of these digital technologies is that they kind of transcend across a number of different types of assistive technology, um, be it uh, Zoom display uh, or Braille displays, um, a number of different iPads, Android devices, all of these different things. And um, so what, one of the things we did was when we noticed that there was that need there, um, we built what's called, a, we started building an assistive technology hub. Um, so students could come and maybe take a loan of a piece of equipment or try it out or just to get familiar with it. Um, we actually, we had to, we, we had some key funding there from a, a solicitor or a law business firm in Ireland. We found that a lot of the bigger companies now are becoming part of our movement as well. Um, they're called Mason, Hayes and Curran and they're helping us. 
um, they helped us uh, as one of the key funders to develop that that space, um, and that's kind of proved very successful. Um, but what we're finding is children are just so adept at using technology, regardless of any ability or disability. It's just amazing to watch and uh, and to be part of it as well. Um, so what that leads on for me for for the inclusive design is if children are using this technology now we'll have to develop our interfaces and keep developing them in a way they're so used to using this type of interface that as they get older and disabilities may increase or more people will find they have some smaller disabilities as well they're going to have to know how to use this too so developing inclusively and and creating an inclusive user experience with accessibility as the kind of bedrock in that is just makes perfect sense it does antonio so the, uh, um, the kids that you are working that you are working with are they using uh, their own devices? Because today devices have become much cheaper and uh, and more more sophisticated. Or are they using devices that are supplied by the uh, by the education system in Ireland? So uh, uh, yes, a number of yes to both questions. Answer, both questions really. Some of them they may have an iPad. In their uh, in their house and they'll okay in, and they'll use that um, and put their books on that. But they are also funded. Some of the stuff is funded from the Department of Education as well. Um, a lot of the Braille note takers can be more expensive. Um, I think they range in price from around three thousand euros. I don't know what that is in dollars. Maybe three and a half thousand dollars, give or take. Um, so that is th th there is funding there for them. But as I said. A number of households, or most households, they might have some sort of a device, so um, they will use their their iPad. They can use their own iPads or their own Android devices. So one of the things was that happened was with Daisy, and for example, when it first started in 2007, it took a long time to get people interested in it and to realize the potential benefits of it, the benefits of the software, and um, which really started on a desktop environment. Um, but as they grew on, they would say to us, they would ring us and say, I have an iPad, can I put my daisy book on the iPad? And we would say, we think so, let's go work out how to do it. So we would work that out and we develop some sort of instruction manual for that so the student can use the books that we provide on their uh, on their devices. And then along came the Androids, which were adopting the same type of interaction model for, for, vi for VI, kids with VI, uh, or kids who are blind. Um, and then we would create another instructional document. So we kind of became like a support system as well. Um, for that, one of the most enjoyable parts of my job is get the phone calls and to work through the issues and the, and the problems that, that people are finding, that the teachers as well, the parents, how do I get this book onto this device and make it work? Um, and I think that's one of the most enjoyable parts, as I said, is when I hear them at the other end going, well, hey, it works. Um, it really, feel, it really, it really makes you feel good, um, and uh, it's it, it's part of why I enjoy what I do. Um, yeah. So, so when you have to, let's say, uh, work on uh, uh, updates for the system, upgrade or or sometimes trying to find a new uh, ways to improve uh, the the software and the apps, are you doing any work? Uh, what type of work are you conducting? To, uh, to get feedback from users, you go back to the to the list of queries and questions, and you use them. What is the process to to improve uh, uh, the work that you are already doing? I would always take I I would take, kind of take a I would work through a how they are navigating through the the system, how they how they find well this button is here, I can't see it. How is there another way I can navigate through my book? Um, what we what we did was we included a number of heading structures, and that's how we use their nav based the navigation model on. Um, sometimes what happens is from a software point of view, a lot of the companies uh, they bring out updates and they don't tell us. So a month or two down the line, I we'll get another phone call and say this doesn't work anymore, and I go I didn't know that. Let me check it out, and we'll work out another way around it. Um, I find that. Some of the softwares that we work with are at varying stages of less, less broken, but there's always a new way of doing something. Um, and I do a lot, of, we do, as I said, we're, we are always looking one step ahead. Daisy has been around for a long time. Um, so over the last few years, we've been looking at EPUB as a, as a format. Um, 
as an accessible format that we can put these large textbooks on, uh, create a, create that format, and then they can use those. Um, and EPUB has kind of been adopted as this non-proprietary format for by a huge amount of companies so that are providing different types of software and hardware as well. Amazon took it. Um, well, the Amazon the Amazon is actually the Mobi format, but they take everything as EPUB and then they they flip it around to their own uh, proprietary model. But uh, uh, EPUB can go on Apple devices, Android devices, pretty much every device. And if you set up the book right, it could actually be the, the text behind the EPUB can be displayed in Braille and Braille note takers as well. We're doing a lot of collaboration with kind of bigger companies. I found that a lot of companies are interested in what Child Vision to do um, because just just because of what we do. Um, I spent a lot of time collaborating with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, who are a, a, a large scale publishing company in the US, but they have an office in Ireland as well. And I spent some time with their accessibility team as well, and we were working on some issues and working on collaborating on them, and then they'll come to us and do some work with learning about VI and visual impairment and things like that. But um, yeah, there's always there's always something to be done. There's always some yeah. some, some issue to find or work out. But it, the thing that's exciting for me to hear is that <clears throat> it seems like it's very seamless. It seems like what you're doing now is just it's just part of assuring that all children get access to education, which is good. And I think about now my babies are uh, in their 30s now, so <laughs> I definitely am telling my age. But I am curious if one thing that we found in the United States when my children were younger and my daughter having Down syndrome and needing support with assistive technology was the teachers really just had not been educated. I mean, this uh, think about it. It's, it's funny when you think about the length of time. This is 15 years ago, let's say. And so many things have changed. Technology has changed. It's just the world in my lifetime has changed. I mean, when I was born, they uh, a few years later, they got television, black and white television. I, it's just so much has changed in our lifetimes, no matter what age you are. So I'm yeah. curious, one thing that we found were some of the biggest problems when my children were in school were that the teachers, they just did not, they did not know how to accommodate these students. They didn't understand the assistive technology. They, there was just so much they didn't know. And I'm not sure how much that has improved in the United States. I know the teachers are underpaid and overwhelmed. And, you know, there's a lot of issues um, going on about education, but I'm just curious because there's so many interesting things that happen in Ireland. I, I'm always fascinated with the innovation I see coming from Ireland. Mm. And it might be partially some of that innovation. The reason why I know about it is because Antonio is just so involved in so many of these issues. And so I track what he's doing, but there does seem to be a lot of innovation happening in Ireland. So I would be curious if you found that the teachers are understanding these issues a little better and why it's so important. And uh, I would also be curious, Dan, because as you said, Daisy's been a lot around a long time and they've done powerful things. And we have the EPUB and there's a lot of efforts being made all over the world. Mm. Are you finding people are continuing to talk together, share notes, um, understand from each other, learn from each other? Um, what are we doing to build the awareness so that uh, and I'll tell you another problem that I saw when I was dealing with this myself was that the the assistive technology did not stay with the child. So they might get their assistive technology needs solved in elementary, but then when they went to middle school, uh, that was a different school. And yeah. then when they went to high school, so then we were like, wow, you know, that's probably really bad because then they would get nothing on summer breaks or vacations. I'm just curious if some of these issues have started being solved. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as I don't, I don't work teaching the kids necessarily, but we do talk a lot with the teachers. And you know, Ireland is, as you said, it's a, it's a very creative country, and a very yes. innovation is huge there. Education wise, I sometimes I feel that possibly the kids are they're not accommodated as well as they could be. Um, yes, as you say, the, the, the technology is, becomes part of the school or unless the, the student can afford to buy it themselves or, or get funding that's just for them, for that school. And yes, as they move between 
you know, primary or elementary and middle school, high school, that there's a commitment, but it's all about the support structures that they have in place within the school. I mean, the reading service department in Child Vision, we provide up from age four up to age 18, um, and, and that's what we do. But then when they move to college, or I'm sure that's that becomes part of the, 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 the university itself has their own um, disability, for want of a better word, resource services, area to right. services, right. yeah, to, to, to help that to help that student uh, or to, to provide for the student and provide as much as they can for the student. Um, in terms of you you alluded to the speed about things are changing. It's just it's mind blowing. Um, I think my daughter is one of her first one of my daughter's first. She's seven now. It was her first word was YouTube. It, it's, <laughs> you know, or YouTube, I think she called it. But um, and even my 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 niece who's two now she's she's already learning the interaction behind um behind the mobile technology which is just amazing to, it's amazing to observe and to, to watch that that this is it's just part of life now and and which is great in, in one good way and a little bit scary <laughs> in another way um i think in terms of the awareness of children who have disabilities uh, 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 or in, in whatever like visual impairment hearing impairment is what we do on Access Chat is talking about it all the time. And I'd love to see more teachers being involved and, and asking yes. more questions. I mean, I, sometimes if I don't know the answer, I'll say, I don't know the answer right now, but we'll, let's work it out and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, I found that a number of uh, bigger companies now are beginning to kind of adopt that more inclusive mindset. Um, in terms of how do, the, how do we create things that makes this accessible, although sometimes I'll find that companies don't, uh, you know, and sometimes I'll go through a form or something online and I'll say, I'm just going to check this with voiceover on my smartphone just or with talkback on my smartphone just to see. And uh, yeah, it's terrible. And it's such a simple thing to do. I mean, I remember last week, Neil was, was mentioning how he sees a day or he visits or hopes for a day that it's actually accessibility becomes infused as part of and and I saw this other great article recently about um, how if you think of it's, it's a series of layers um, designing anything specifically in the digital realm designing anything is a series of layers and I think at the very lowest layer the very foundational layer is accessibility and then when you move out from that then you've got inclusive design then you've got your usability and that's surrounded by your UX or your user experience. And but by addressing the accessibility first, you're just creating a better product for everybody. Um, right. And that you adopt and you bring it into your 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 just your your psyche. And it's just I'm always going to make this button 48 pixels by 48 pixels because that's the size of a, 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 an adult human fingertip. And most humans have fingers. Uh, and some, even if somebody who's ha, who has some mobility issues, you make the button big. You put the the, the padding around it, they can still focus, they can still tap it, or even if they're using a mouth stick, or if they're using their eye blink, or something like that. You know, there's just using switch access. It's it's a it's 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 just you know I could talk about this stuff for ages, and I normally do, but you can just go on and on and on, and it just makes sense to. And I don't know why. Sometimes I don't see why. Sometimes I think the accessibility part is tick the box sticker where you conform right. to WCAG. You know. Right. Compliance, compliance. We compliance. that's it's all about compliance in the U.S. But I, you know, speaking of the digital natives, and I bet you Antonio is going to want to come in on this too. I am curious. I don't know this answer, but with these digital natives, how do you really? If they're going to demand that they're included and that we're thinking about this with inclusive design. And I, I have friends of mine that have little babies and um, a friend of mine had a baby and she was like six months old and she was grabbing for his phone and she was pinching it and pulling the making the picture bigger. And he was like, how does she know how to do this? It's like it's so interesting our brains and how they're evolving and the digital natives and then you know to, i know you're going to want this antonio so i'm going to stop because you see where i'm going with this but uh -huh. how exciting is this so oh, you go great. neil and then we'll throw it to dan no i have to take because i've been working with and looking at our kids use technology and i have to say digital natives is more about 
the mindset of the individual than it is with age. Okay. Uh, however, what what I feel is uh, uh, by observation and questioning, uh, there's a, sometimes when we ask kids, you know about technology, uh, they say yes, but in in fact they don't know. They are just in they are just in fear of missing out or in fear of sometimes, oh, the other kid knows, I need to say that I know about it. So, and this happens a lot. Kids sometimes, when we tell them about, oh, can you use an iPad, can you use that? They have a, a, an affirmative answer, just because they, they sometimes is what expected from them. When sometimes they are still, uh, uh, they didn't have the opportunity of learning or their learning path is still at a level uh, that they still need to ask a lot of questions to be, uh, so I think it's more a question of, of mindset and openness, okay. and sometimes is a question of, of uh, what we call social inclusion, is having the opportunity of, have, of having access to a device, because not, not all kids have access to them for many different reasons. Right? Why we mentioned at the beginning of the show that some kids in Ireland get f f are funded to be able to use these devices and get them. While the others have have them at home, so I think it's a it's a very complex issue that we we all need to keep a, a, a mind very open in order to be able to help everyone. Yeah, good point. Yeah, Go I like the mindset comment. It's something I hadn't thought of that it is it is you know that if you're afforded the opportunity to 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 try out or to experiment or to spend time using something. That's you know it's 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 a scale in and of itself, isn't it really? I mean, I, I how we were taught to touch type, um, you know, you, you're taught to do something and then you remember it forever, and it's that that same type of interaction, um, the pinch zoom, yeah, there's some there's some fantastic, innovative products on coming on the market that are just going to change everything all over again. But no, if you I, uh, I think at the beginning when the iPad was released. There's a good number of um, elderly persons who started to read again, no? Mm. Because they, they were able to, you know, use the app in the way, and uh, you know, it improved the way how they were using it. And they also adopted that technology when they were able to see how useful it could be. And we are talking about people who never used their computer before. Yeah, I spoke to a, a good colleague, a good friend of mine who's blind, and he um, he he loves the 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 iOS or the system. But he obviously he doesn't need to see it, but he loves the iOS system and he loves the mobility. So he uses a, an iPad mini. Fits in his pocket. He can walk around with it, take it out, do use use the, the swipe interactions um, whenever he wants. Um, which funnily goes back to and it's it's again, it's just something I was I was thinking about, you know, when people speak about designing accessible websites, web apps, and the phrase is keyboard accessibility. And I was thinking about this last night and I was saying, but 90% of you, any visitor uses a, to a website uses a mobile. So really what you're thinking is, you're saying keyboard accessibility, that goes hand in hand with swipe accessibility. If you build something inclusively and it's keyboard accessible, it's also swipe accessible for people who use, again, the people who would use switch access, the people who would use um, keyboard or voiceover, talkback in the mobile context. Um, yeah, it's no. Yeah, yeah. The desktop became or laptop is more a, a device that you use at work <laughs> or, or to do yeah. that or heavy, heavy task. But you know, or on the weekends, at the end of the day, you end up using your phone when you are at home in bed over Wi-Fi or when you are in a coffee shop. Is uh, actually the time of the day that you are actually paying more attention to something is actually when you have the small device in your hand. <laughs> Yeah. Good point. Good yeah. point. I didn't think about that. Yeah. And it's interesting, all of the all of these things. And once again, I totally agree with what Antonio is saying, but a six month old that doesn't even speak yet, understanding that to make the picture bigger, she can pinch it. It, it now maybe what that is is inclusive design. That's a logical mm. thing that a human being would try to do if they had not already been conditioned like someone like me. Um, to do things another way. I remember when I first got an iPad, the very, and this was years ago, but I was so confused. And I would take it to my daughter, Sarah, that has Down syndrome, and she would be like, what's wrong with you, mom? mom? And she would be like, boom. She And and, yeah. and I thought, okay, 
try to forget how you've learned it and think of the easiest way to do something. If I wanted to do something, could I just touch the screen? And then it would say, what are you trying to do here? And it was, re I remember it really confused my brain. And, and you were yeah. talking about, uh, Antonio was talking about older people starting to use devices and stuff and realizing they can read. Well, I can see, but my eyesight um, has declined and I and it and my eyes hurt a lot. I have dry eye syndrome. And so it hurts me to read a lot. And I read all day long on the computer because that's my job. But at night, as Antonio is saying, that's when I'm getting my device out and I'm using the Audible. You know, I am mm -hmm. I have way too many books on my Audible um, <laughs> account. Uh, they, they must so appreciate me, but, but I love to read, but it's harder for me physically to read now just because my body. And, but I still want to read. I still want to read and consume. And I, I actually find also that the way I could, I, my brain works, I, I digest the book better when somebody's reading it to me. It's the way my brain works. De Deborah, but, but you know, uh, audio books is something that I, I use a lot when, I, when I'm traveling, when I'm walking. No, they can be, you know, uh, useful for in many different situations. I know right. I, I spend a lot of time here in Portugal yeah. and then I go to Ireland. You know, it's not really handy to bring books in your bags, you know. Right. You want That's to have access right. to them in different places. So it's one of those cases where technology that can be used by, by, by you know, it's, uh, when you design things on accessibility, they end up being able to use by almost everyone in a natural way. Yeah, and for so many different reasons too. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, no. Um, what I was thinking there was, um, as we we, we talk about, we were always listening to audiobooks and stuff like that. In the in the textbook arena, it's 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 a, kind of a whole different kettle of fish because you've got so many different types of assets within the the book. So you would have mathematical constructs, you may have images, you may have, and then you have your normal text as well, and to someone to just listen to that it just doesn't it, it, you don't process things in the same way i think that an audio, an audio is a transitive signal you hear it and it's gone um one child said to me one time and this was long before uh bra the braille note takers kind of took off that he said for me to learn something i have to feel it under my fingertips because that's how he processes information the, the, the sense of, of touch that he had developed and um, that's how he learned he was able to track back track forward and things um, so it's that that tactile uh, medium of of learning is is still so 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 important. I mean, we still do the we still do the braille books, the actual print braille book or the embossed braille book. But more and more over the last few years, children have started ordering just text only files that they can then translate into braille on a single line braille display, and just feel and learn that way as well. Um, again, you design you design for a keyboard, you design for a swipe. You're designing inclusively with your heading structures and all your semantic elements. You're therefore designing for Braille as well. It, it, it's a it's such an interesting thing. And um, the tactile, right. the whole tactile, the, the whole tactile model. Um, I thought of something really interesting there uh, as we we're talking. We, we were talking about um, how you con consuming information, and, and one of the things that, as I said about Braille, is for children to learn. A lot of the children for them to learn something if they can't see, they have to feel it on their fingertips. For a long time, we were developing uh, as part of our the books that we transcribe. It's one of the things is um, transcribing diagrams. So it could be a, a 2D diagram, a number line or something. But what uh, other things we were describing were 3D models, so 3D transcriptions. So it's a think of a cube, it's a 3D cube to us. So we draw a 3D cube on a plate on a page. To us, visually, it looks like a 3D cube, but to someone who's just feeling it, it's just totally lines going all over the place. So one of my colleagues, what she developed was with the 3D printing, was started developing actual cubes and circles and spheres and with Braille on them, which became, a, yeah, it's become, we developed it as part of a maths kit, um, and which we're giving to students now as well, so that they, if, it also came was there was a primary school book and it was to do with telling the time, and there was about 200 instances of clocks with different times on it. So instead of having to describe, transcribe that same clock with different hand, hands in different places, 200 times we actually, uh, my colleague developed a, uh, an actual 3D printed clock with Braille that she can move the hands on, um, which I thought was 
really cool. Um, and then there's there's tons of other different things, braille cells at different sizes. So a student who are young and they can learn what braille feels like and move it down and down and smaller and smaller. Because what was happening was a lot of children, when they were learning braille, for example, they would start off, the first way they would learn the whole concept of a braille square, it's the six dots uh, in, a, in, a, in a rectangular formation. They were using a, a egg box. So the six eggs in an egg box and how they all relate. And then they were going from that straight down to the braille cell, which you can fit under your fingertip. So what we started developing was different sized braille cells that were interchangeable. The dots are interchangeable, pre-d printed, of course. And then as you move down and down and down, get smaller and smaller. So you begin to build up your uh, your your touch skills. Um, yeah. So as you say, it's wow. innovation in Ireland is fantastic. Yes, it's so I, I exciting. <laughs> Go ahead. No, you mentioned, I think, imagine the possibilities now. At the moment, for what I assume you received, you are receiving the books when they are already written, completed, and then you do your work. Now, mm -hmm. imagine that you could be involved in the process of, you know, when they are working on the programs, when they know putting together, you know, what is going to be on chapter six, seven, uh, and then you could, okay, or you could, plan uh, inclusion in terms of what you do, even including the, 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 the models and the 3D printing from an early stage, everything could be part of the whole program, not just, okay, now I need to move this piece of After content the to fact. text. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think right. After be, the fact. Yeah. yeah. The phrase that's used is text remediation, but you're remediating something that was already designed. It'd be good if you just mediate in the middle or, or as part of the process. Um, right. Yeah. So. I mean, with with the 3D printing, it's 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 great, and there there's other you know there's some fantastic stuff going on there. So yeah, yeah, it is so so exciting. Well, I think that we could talk about this all day long because this is so interesting. And and Dan, we are just so grateful to have you on the program and have you really a big part of the Access Chat community because you're the reason why we created this community. So it's very exciting to have these really rich conversations. And I want to make sure that we do a shout out to Barclays for supporting Access Chat for a long time. We love them and we love how accessible they are. And also another shout out to my clear text for making sure we are walking the walk, talking the talk, and we're accessible. I, I see often with videos and um, d different tweet chats that have videos and people are forgetting to make them accessible even when they're talking about accessibility accessibility and disability inclusion. So we are very proud to always be accessible and to make sure that everybody's included. So Dan, thank you for being on the program. Antonio, Elaine, Neil, we Thanks, appreciate guys. everybody. Yeah, yeah and brilliant. we look forward to taking this to Tuesday. And if for any Americans watching this, remember Access Chat is at four o'clock next Tuesday because we're moving our clocks ahead early again. So there's we're going to be at four o'clock for Access Chat uh, next Tuesday, and we'll make sure we say that on Twitter too. So thank you, Dan. Thanks, Antonio. Bye, Elaine. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Antonio. Bye-bye. Thanks, Elaine.